there are just lots and well, lots is, is an understatement. There are just hundreds, if not thousands of obstacles that one must overcome in order to write a book like this. Um, and some of them are larger and some of them are smaller than others. Um, but they all have to be jumped and, um, it, it will be hard to just pick out one or two, really. I mean, organization of information is a, is a huge one, absolutely huge. Um, that's my biggest day-to-day challenge, I suppose, is is keeping structure to this vast, vast welter of, of information that needs to be organized um, in order for the book to be written. Um, an awful lot of personal relationships have to be formed with the people that I'm reaching out to. They, I have to show that, uh, demonstrate that I am worthy of their trust, uh, that I will honour them and what and their role in this story. Uh, and by that, I don't mean only be nice to them in print, because I'm not interested in just being nice to people. But I mean honour their trust in me. So if they're prepared to show me things, open up to me, divulge whatever it is that I'm asking them, then I must prove myself worthy of, of their belief in me. So that means maintaining an awful lot of relationships. Um, and every relationship is different. You know, some are high maintenance, some are low maintenance. You know, that it must all be done in a kind of polite English way. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I, I have an absolute love for what I do. Um, um, you know, I love this subject. Again, I must stress, I'm not out to, I say this in a number of interviews, I'm not out to polish the Beatles' reputation to say how great they were. This is not a book, this is not a fanboy's book. Far from it. This is a historian's work. Now, they popularise a lot of American music that way that wasn't even popular here. The, the Beatles' first album is um, is principally a New York sound. It's the music of um, 1650 Broadway, properly known as the Brill Building, but actually that was across the street. <laughs> it's the music of Jerry Goffin and Carole King and, and acts like and songwriters like that, uh, Burt Bacharach and Hal David. And that was the first album. The second album was really a Detroit sound. Mm -hmm. They were looking for the Motown sound, the Tamla Motown sound. And then they exploded in America and were able to give back to you the music that was yours in the first place, but often hadn't been heard before. Uh, the Beatles first appeared on the radio in England in a session before they actually had a recording contract. Uh, and one of the songs they played in their first broadcast was Please Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes on Tamla. Uh, and I thought, I wonder how many times that record or anything else from Tamla had been played on British radio before. So again, this is uh, nothing digitized here. I spent days going through microfilm records, wearing out my eyes, <laughs> turning the, the film round and round and round on all the BBC program output records. <laughs> so every record played in every radio show it would be logged. And I went through the logs. And they, it turned out that my hunch was right. They were the first to play a Tamla, a Tamla sound from Detroit wow. on BBC radio. And then in their next broadcast, they played a song, Ask Me Why, that was based on a Tamla record mm -hmm. or inspired by a Tamla record. So that was also a first. They, I'm sure, didn't know any of this. Right, right. They were just doing it. You know, it's, right. it's down to the historian to come along and put it into context. But they were doing it. They were the first. In 1965, uh, a weekly magazine in England called Fabulous, yeah. which really started because of the Beatles, it was about the whole scene, but it was, but it was really the Beatles' explosion helped fashion that magazine into existence. Uh, had a profile on Mimi, and she allowed a couple of elements from her, you know, artifacts from her archives, from her, from her drawers, if you like. She would just pull out all these drawers, and there was John's art and childhood <laughs> stuff in there. Yeah. And one of them was this poem that he wrote to Mimi on the occasion of the death of Uncle George, her husband, George. And he calls Mimi the best of the five, meaning the five sisters, yeah. one of whom, of course, was his mother, yeah. um, and said that they weren't really there for her, at her in her hour of need. So, And this was published yeah. in 1965. And um, I actually had an email from Hunter Davis the other week saying, I would love to have put this in the book of the John Lennon letters, but I didn't know about it. Yeah. Where did you find it? And I wrote back saying, well, it was published. <laughs> it was published, but you just need, you know, you need to get to all this material. Oh, yeah. And um, that's yeah. part of the reason why this took 10 years, because you just keep going on and deeper and deeper and deeper. Didn't he also use Frank Sinatra's Young at Heart? 
in that poem? That was an interesting thing for me because I, I listened while writing this book to all the music that was around in through that period. And he wrote that poem in 55. And in 54, into 55, there was... Frank Sinatra had a hit called Young at Heart. And John Lennon uses one of the lines from the song in this right. piece about Mimi. And as I say in the book, that's like, it's the first example we have of him right. using popular song mm -hmm. to express an emotion. One of the things I do in this book is I actually name, number all the years. <clears throat> so 1958 is really the year when the Beatles are first, they're not the Beatles yet, but in fact, they went around as a trio at one point, John, Paul and George, called J Page Three. <laughs> it was a new discovery. That yeah. was something that had never surfaced yeah. before. Where did that, where did you find well, it? I just was, it, um, tracked down this guy who was actually their manager mm. for a while and had a recording of them that he wiped, unfortunately. Um, but they, they were J page three, J for John, P A for Paul, and G E for George, and three because they were a trio, mm. uh, three guitarists. And um, that is year one, 1958, when they start going around together is year one. So 1964, when they played the Sullivan Show, that's year seven. You know, there is a tendency in America yeah. to think they kind of arrived when they played the Sullivan show but that was year seven and when they broke up it was year 13 now they don't get a recording contract till year five yeah. but but that doesn't mean they're not together they're still you know very much working and finding out who they are and <clears throat> young lads having fun and all that and and having adventures but um so actually they were together 13 years wow. much more than people realize you know anybody who sings uh on stage in public or indeed even just in the bath at home um, 99,000 people out of 99,001, <laughs> everybody except John Lennon basically, would begin by adapting their voice to the song that they're singing, the version that they've heard of it. They might sing in, in an American voice or in the voice of the original artist. Um, and then eventually, if you stay in the profession of singing, your own personality, your own voice will emerge. If you're lucky, if you're good. But the extraordinary thing about this recording of John Lennon at the age of 16 is to hear that he sounds like only John Lennon. He doesn't sound American. He doesn't sound like the record. He is just himself. And that is the sign of a true original. Well, conscription in the UK uh, was mandatory um, from, I think, 1939. Obviously, during the war, men were conscripted to fight uh, against the Germans. But... Beyond that, Britain kept a, an army of conscripts. And if you were 18 years old in the UK, in that period of time, you had to go and do your army duty mm -hmm. for 18 months plus another six months in reserve. So essentially two years. Uh, and it was the one unavoidable fact of life. Unless you happen to be medically unfit, you would have to go off and do your army duty. And this looms greatly for John, Paul, George and Richie and Stuart and all the other guys um, it loomed over their lives, over their teenage years, like this terrible threat that they knew was coming and they couldn't avoid it. And then by just being the right age at the right time, they avoided it because the law changed. Yeah. Had the law not changed, they would have gone into the army. And as I say in the book, George would have done his army service from 1962 to 64. <laughs> he wouldn't have been on the Ed Sullivan show. Right. Right. He would have been on a, in a barracks somewhere polishing his boots. Wow. It's just a, a trifling one, really, but... Um, when the Beatles went to Scotland in 1960, driving around the Highlands in a van and it was involved in a crash. And when they crashed, it was at the top of the hill coming down into Banff, I know, because I've been there and looked at exactly why they crashed, because it's a difficult junction. And um, after they crashed, someone came running out of the house, a kid came running out of the house, and having heard that there was an incident outside the, her front door, and saw that they were entertainers and rushed back inside and got her autograph book and in <laughs> wow. the, came out, back out and got the very first ever set of Beatles autographs, um, which you can see on the, on the internet and they're, yeah. they're going to be in the extended edition of this book. Well, that gave me the date and time of the crash and the place of the crash. So I then went to the little local newspaper in Scotland, which I'd looked at before looking for advertisements as to mm. whether they might have played there. But I hadn't looked for news of the crash wow and this time I've, i was in the library and i'm going through every tiny page. this is like i can't remember the name of the paper now but anyway it's right up there in the top of scotland a little local paper 
and I found the mm -hmm. report and it's the very first time the Beatles were ever mentioned in print Wow. wow! So you know, millions of articles yeah. and books later, <laughs> and there it is. There had to be because a first a crash. Wow. And, yeah, and there it was, and it had B double E, not B A, -E, <laughs> right. right. a common misspelling for yeah. years to come. But there it was, and it was like yes, <laughs> you know, just to find that in the library, and uh, it's just a line in the book, but it, it's it, it's, it's just typical of the good good times I yeah. had researching this. <laughs> One of the questions I mean, people often ask me, "What if so and so? What if so and so hadn't happened?" I'm not very good on what if questions because it didn't happen. So what's there to talk about? Yeah. And also, I don't know who does with probably one exception. And that is what if Brian Epstein hadn't come along, would the Beatles still have made it? People ask what I found with this book is that had he not come along, they would have broken up because they went to Hamburg the second time in the spring of 1961. They came back at um, the end of June um, or the beginning of July, and they started playing again on Merseyside, they were commanding about five times the nightly fee of any other group. They were packing them in. So promoters paid this high fee through gritted teeth, but look at the business they brought in for everybody. Um, there was a newspaper called Mersey Beat mm -hmm. by this point, mm -hmm. and, and they wrote about the Beatles more than any other, and when the opinion poll... The popularity poll ran, the Beatles won it. They were far and away the biggest group in Liverpool. So, and this is typical of them, they got bored. There were no challenges for them. From July into August into September, they're beginning to go, well, where next? Because it was called a circuit. You would play the circuit, the so-and-so hall on a Monday night, so-and-so hall on a Tuesday night. And literally, it was a circuit. They were just going round and round and round and round and round, and that might be enough for most. But for Lennon and McCartney and Harrison, and yeah, Pete Best was there as well, it was just like, what next? What next? You know, where's the challenge? Uh, and Bob Wooler, who was um, their confidant at that time, he was the guy who was... They saw him virtually every night at the different halls. He was the DJ and the MC and mm -hmm. all of that. Kind of like the Alan Freed of, of Liverpool, um, but not as wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he, he is categoric or was categoric that they were going to break up unless something happened for them. Some breakthrough happened, they were going to break up. And John and Paul go off to Paris in October 61 and they leave George and Pete behind and they break the bookings with a few promoters, which burns even more bridges. One by one, they were pissing off every promoter that they were, who was paying them. So they, John and Paul faced the prospect of returning to Liverpool and virtually no bookings anymore because they've annoyed everybody one time too many. Yeah. And Brian comes along. Yeah. And Brian comes along and he makes a promise to them to double their income, which is really hard considering that he can't book them into any of the places they've been playing because the promoters don't want them anymore. Um, but they're gonna, he's going to double their income and he's going to get them onto the radio and hopefully television and he will do all he can to get them a record contract. That's the, that's, that's the, the holy thing. grail. That is the holy grail. Make a record. The reality is that I, I too, like everybody else, when I wrote the recording sessions book, I assumed that the Beatles' first visit to Abbey Road was an audition of some kind, a test, uh, an artist test or a commercial test. That would have been the phrase of the, of the time. Um, until in 1991, I was rooting around in the archives at EMI. I love paperwork. Paperwork is, is what I search the world for. Um, and I found all sorts of pieces of paper which pointed very clearly to the fact that when the Beatles first came to Abbey Road, they were actually already under contract, that there was not a test at all. They were already signed. So, so why would they be signed when George Martin hasn't even met them yet? So I was working with George on a TV special in the making of Sergeant Pepper, and I spread out all the... I photocopied everything, and I spread them all out in front of George on the kind of edit suite desk, and I said, I don't understand what's happening here. Can you please explain to me? The documents had his signature on them from 62. And he looked at them and, and, and it, it had, could, had, he had no answer. He couldn't actually explain what it was. Um, he was baffled by it. And I could see he was genuinely baffled. He kind of um, talked himself into believing the, the other story yes. of how they were signed. And therefore, when confronted with this, genuinely no longer remembered it that way. 
that was okay for the time. It, it left me unsatisfied, but I knew that, you know, there, there was something there that was unsolved. Well, when I came to write these books, I knew I had to get to the bottom of that one. I couldn't just have a conundrum in the book uh, of such magnitude. So um, it all fell into place when I lucked into, well, I've been looking for him for years, but in the end, I lucked into finding a guy called Kim Bennett, uh, Kim, a male Kim, um, who was, uh, he worked at an EMI music publishing firm called Ardmore and Beechwood. And he had liked a Lennon and McCartney song that he had heard on the Decca tape, the failed audition for Decca, um, and wanted to publish it. And through his interest, the Beatles, Brian Epstein found himself um, with George Martin in May 1962 um, discussing a contract. Now, why was George Martin offering them a contract? Well, it's a convoluted uh, and and quite multifaceted combination of reasons, but the reality is that he was given them as a chore. He had his arm twisted. It was an assignment. It was an assignment. They was, they, in effect, they were signed by EMI, and then it was like, well, who shall we give them to? EMI had four in-house producers at that time. And for various reasons, George was given that job. Um, so they were signed. He had never met them. The only bit of their music he had heard he didn't like, uh, didn't rate at all highly. So why on earth would he have signed them? When he met them, and this is what's so tremendous about George Martin being the right guy, when he met them, he recognised immediately that these guys were original, that they had attitude, that they had opinions, that they spoke up, that they were funny, that they were charismatic, and that they were the something. Who else was called the something? He was himself a maverick in everything he did. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't like abiding by the rules. He was always trying to subvert the rules in the best way possible, in the creative sense. Uh, and when he met them, he recognised that they were the same. So he knew that they were good guys and that something might come of this, but what would they record? And it was at that point that he decided he would find them a song, which was the role of a, a producer. He wasn't even called a producer then. He was an A&R man. Mm -hmm. uh, and A&R people at record companies will tend to, these days will scout the talent, but they won't necessarily take them into the studio. But his job was to find the artist and, artist and repertoire. So he found the artist, then he went looking for the repertoire, which was how do you do it? And then he said, come down, boys, you're going to make a record. Um, the great strength of the relationship between the Beatles and George Martin manifests itself very fast. By November of 62, still within the realm of this book, he is completely tuned into who they are. He realises how original they are. He wants to do an album with them. He talks about going to the Cavern and making their first album a live album, which is what Please Please Me would have been. Um, and he's, he's fully tuned in. And when they make the Please Please Me single, he presses the button to say, congratulations, boys, you've just made your first number one. And he meant it. Things that makes me laugh about Beatles literature, and this was happening right from the start in the 1960s, is that you would get the Beatles say in an interview, you know, the Beatles remarked, whatever, as if all four of them spoke at the same time with one voice. They, sh they had a lot of common interests. And there was this wonderful thing that they had whereby if one person, one of the Beatles got into something, they would all four enthuse about it. But India was something that they actually wanted something different from. And when they went there, they had different experiences, even though they're in the same place. And when they came back, they were different people. So the Beatles pre-India pre-Rishikesh we're talking here and post-Rishikesh are different. And it certainly fragmented them even just on a practical level. I mean, Ringo went home, I think, after only two or three weeks or something like that. Um, Paul went home shortly after George and John stayed on a little longer. But even just in terms of that, um, I think it, it fragmented them. It literally did. Um, it, 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 no one seemed to take any exception to Ringo leaving early um, because he had good cause. Um, Maureen, was his wife, was not happy there and they were missing the kids. And he went there for two weeks. I mean, that's wonderful. Um, I don't know that... I'm looking into this, but I, I have a feeling that George wasn't too enamoured of Paul leaving when he did. 
Uh, and they also, both John and George, knew whilst they were there for a month without Paul and Ringo, that things were being done in their name by Paul back in London that they weren't party to, which they wouldn't discover in, in fullness until they got home. Uh, and that particular that doesn't seem to upset John very much, but it did upset George. Hmm. So George and Paul's relationship post Rishikesh was different to the pre Rishikesh one. By the time of Press to Play, his his singles just were not cracking it at all. Yeah. Uh, Press and Only Love Remains, which yeah. he yeah. even went on the Royal Variety Show as a last minute addition just to plug a record, which yeah. I thought was really uh, wish something I wish he hadn't done. Yeah, um, and it didn't work anyway. So and um, he remixed all of those singles. Oh, yes. All of the singles were Countless. remixed. Pretty Little it, Head. They, I think there yeah. were nine variations of Pretty Little Head. And just uh, to Angry try and get God Horns, on. everything. And yeah. It was like, God, stop already. Yeah. You know? mm. But, but mm. the thing is, it's so easy to look at these artists purely through record releases. And that's, that's the default action that we all have. We talk about the Flowers in the Dirt period and the Ram period and the band on the run period and so on but what it really is is a man's life and broad street showed us that he was willing for the first time to openly embrace his beetle past now the film broad street is the defining moment of paul's post beatles career in that if you were to scale it on a graph it reaches broad street and falls from there because yeah. broad street is a commercial and critical disaster I love talking about Give My Regards to Broadstreet. I could, I could write a book about it. <laughs> um, not because I think it's the most wonderful film in the world, but because of what it says about who this man is. Yeah. It is unconsciously autobiographical, like any creative piece of work, it is autobiographical, in that this man made this at this time, what's going on in his head. Yeah. And then if you really look at Broadstreet, it's so revealing. But it is a disaster commercially. And I remember thinking at the time, because it was so badly panned, that whatever he does next is going to have to be a, a really great comeback, as it were. And it wasn't. It was Spies Like Us. Yeah. Yes. Spies Like Us, to, oh. me, to me, was just, oh, God, it was just the worst thing he had ever done. And I was sorry for Paul. I wanted him to come out and show us how brilliant he is. The first time I met George... Um, I was there to interview him. It was at a film studios in the handmade films period. And he was running late from the previous interview. He was doing a, an afternoon of interviews and I was like, you know, the penultimate one in the list, I think. And, uh, but as ever with these, you know, with rock stars, you can find yourself waiting three hours, you know, before, after the appointed time. But he was great. He came out and said, look, I don't have time to do this now. Everything's been overrunning, but we could go for a drink if you like. And so me and another guy, uh, also named Mark, Mark Ellen, we jumped in George's car and he drove us around to the bar on the film set, on the film studio lot. And um, then we went for a couple of beers which was great. I mean, it was just great to be sitting at a table having a couple of beers with George. We got on really well. I, you know, it, it was just natural. So when I actually did the interview with him a few days later, it was like we knew each other. And he was nice to me from that point on until I really started working for Paul. Um, and then he kind of just took against me. And the last time I saw him, he was really quite unpleasant. It was at George Martin's house in 1992. We were filming the making of Sergeant Pepper TV documentary, and I was consultant researcher on that, whatever. And um, George Harrison assented to do an interview for it and came over to, I was hoping we'd do it at Friar Park, but he said he'd come over to George Martin's house, which was great. He came over in his Porsche and we hung out in George Martin's house for a while, which was a very nice thing to do, except that he was un unpleasant to me the whole time, George. And um, he tested me. Uh, he, he said, if you're an expert, you know, uh, he pointed to a picture in a book and said, who's that man? An Indian guy who was at a Beatles session. And funnily enough, I'd been at a Beatles convention in L.A. a couple of years earlier and someone had come up to me and said, um, the man in that photograph who you don't, you don't know his name, um, his name is, and he wrote it down on a bit of paper and I stuck it inside the book. 
And so when George said to me, if you're such an expert, who's what's that man's name? I was thinking, oh, God, I was trying to visualize that piece of paper, <laughs> but I couldn't. <laughs> And I couldn't remember the guy's name, and it was a guy called um, Omir Dasgupta, who I now know quite a lot about because he's an interesting fellow, and he was at the sessions and indeed lived at George and Patty's bungalow for a couple of couple of months, I think, in that period of time. Um, and I think played on Within You, Without You as well. So that was the answer. But, you know... Um, not not a very cool thing of George to put me on the spot like that and kind of make that the acid test of whether I was an expert or wasn't. But, you know, he was playing with me. And, you know, the, the thing about famous people is they always think they've got the power in any relationship. Okay. And um, and because because we other mere mortals kind of give it to them. And if, if I was with him now, I'd think I'd just tell him off. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, because why not? Why not? Something happened to me, and that it's basically that there was a. I was approached by a writer for the New Yorker magazine when my Complete Beatles Chronicle came out, which was fall of '92, who was going to do a profile of me for New Yorker. Well, that's a high prestige. He wanted to come to London and interview my family about what I was like as a child and really all strange stuff, mm -hmm. but. He was doing a profile of me, and that's, I guess, what you do. And he wanted to observe me at work. So he said, can I come in the studio at Abbey Road and watch you doing your work on this John Lennon set? Well, it wasn't my decision, so I asked EMI whether they would allow this, and they said yes. Then the journalist said, could we listen to a couple of, be a be <laughs> a couple of Beatles, Beatles multitracks while, while we're doing this? So again, I said, it's not my decision. I'll have to ask. I asked. The word came down. Yes, that's okay. Wow. Wow. So this guy got to hear, I think, Strawberry Fields in a Day in the Life, which I had heard a few times by then, but it was, you know, I was never going to say no to listening to them again. He then wrote the New Yorker piece in a way that was different from the way I'd been led to believe it would be. Oh, it wasn't a profile of me. It was a profile of... Inside the, Abbey Road. Inside Abbey Road. And oh. when that was published, the shit hit the fan. Oh. Majorly. Yeah. Majorly. Yeah. And I, was for the first time ever in my professional relationship with these guys, I, I looked like the bad boy. Wow. It ruined my relationship yes. with George, which had been good. It ruined my relationship with Yoko. Oh. And I got kicked off the Lennon project. Oh, wow. So oh, man. And all the work I had done was scrapped and rob stevens who yeah. was yoko's go-to guy in the studio in new york a engineer um who had worked on a number of reissues anyway like main Live avenue and things he did it well there are lots of good groups around in the 60s there are lots of been good bands around always talented people doing interesting work but the beatles were they were their originators they they, they started so many things we wouldn't be talking about other bands if it wasn't for the beatles you wouldn't be talking about the Beatles if it wasn't for Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly. But all the same, it, the Beatles were the great popularizer. They were the ones who unlocked all the doors. But particularly in something like music, those who do will often say, we've made it, and that's it. That They've reached the top. With the Beatles, they always had the sense that you can get to the top, but staying there is the trick. Uh, and keeping it fresh and keeping it interesting.